A is for Alcoholic is a program about recovery. My name is John, and I'm an alcoholic. And my name is Jerry, and I'm an alcoholic. Join us as we go through the alphabet of alcoholism one letter at a time. So before we get into the meat of this recovery sandwich. The gristle and the meat. Oh, there's no gristle in the sandwich. That's gross. Oh, it's, it's, all, it's all tasty it's stuff. All, yeah. I just wanted to say thanks to all of our Patreon uh, patrons. It's really awesome. Uh, and all of our listeners, for that matter, people who have reached out to me, uh, people I've talked to um, via Instagram and Facebook. It's so great, and it feels so good. And, um, you know, our patrons who also get access to a lot of our, um, well, soon-to-be um, special content <laughs> that we've yeah. been working on, interviews and other discussions that don't fit into the... Um, what would you call it into the the scope into the the alphabet that are sort of yeah. outside the alphabet depending yeah, that on where are outside. we're at yeah that are outside yeah subjects outside of our letter mhm but i just wanted to say thank you so much to chris and to hillary and nicole and thomas and audio angel all of you for um everything that you do to help this become a reality every single week for us and yeah. for everyone else who's listening so Hell it's yeah. pretty awesome mm-hmm. And thank right you very on. much. Thank you. The bonus <laughs> content will just be a video of me lifting weights in my backyard with just a party hat on. Well, and, and tasteful underwear. Don't ta- make yeah, promises. People might be expecting it now. <laughs> and by tasteful underwear, I mean like a whole uh, cover, like jumpsuit. Mm, yes. Is that what the coveralls? The coveralls. Coveralls in a party hat. Coveralls just in party lifting hat. weights, just curling in the backyard. It's, you know, I'm telling you. Put some slow motion, get a nice filter on there, mm-hmm. put some soft music. I'll have my eight-year-old light off some Roman candles. <laughs> Hell yeah. Get the dog involved. Yeah, yeah. We'll just throw mm-hmm. the dog across the frame like that Salvador Dali picture. <laughs> so today on the podcast, <laughs> the letter is P, and we went through a whole list of P's, and we go through a whole list every week and discuss about what we're going to do, and the biggest one seemed... This one seemed important was that the P was going to stand for paradigm shift. Yeah. And Jerry, you had a, a, a definition for yeah. paradigm shift. Can you, you saw read me that open up my phone. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so paradigm shift is a uh, fundamental change in approach or underlying assumptions. And that's exactly what recovery is, regardless of what um, what path you take with your recovery Mm -hmm. you know um there's some literature that talks about it being a personality change and um i think that i mean it's huge it's just you think about the the way that i used to think when when just even after a hard day's work it's like god i just need a drink man i need a drink Mm -hmm. or if something was stressing me out and now i don't i don't think that way i think oh if something's bothering me or something's stressing me out or at the end of a long day, I think like, man, nice glass of iced tea or cracking open a lemon LaCroix. I'm serious. You like a nice iced tea. I know you do. I do. I do. But, you know, like uh, you five years ago would have been like, what the fuck are you talking about? A nice mm-hmm. LaCroix. What's a LaCroix? <laughs> Was LaCroix a thing five years ago? I don't know. Probably. But there is probably like Shasta Cola, you know, like uh, was it? dictator pib or whatever it was like the mm-hmm. off-brand dictator cola. pib yeah so yeah there's this whole idea of um changing the way that you think about things changing the way you think about alcohol changing the way you think about your life um changing your approach to your problems changing the way yeah. that you relate to other human beings both those that you are close to and those that you do not know at all <laughs> and even um, those you hate even those you hate and or if you dislike strongly, let's use that. Yes, that, yes. Guess, even yeah. those that you may harbor resentments against. That's even better <laughs> than hate and just flat out hate. I hate that fool. Yeah. Yeah. So I So Jerry, where does one start to change the way that how does someone transplant their personality? How do well, you <laughs> Well, I have a personal anecdote. Uh, but I've noticed that, uh, I, first off, I'd like to say that, uh, uh, w- 
my bottom, sorry, I was I was trying to find the right way to phrase mm-hmm. this. My bottom was is not what you would call a low bottom. I had a mid bottom. It probably wasn't even a mid bottom. It was probably a higher bottom than most. You know, my my alcoholism is doing squats, I guess. But um, I, uh, I I I wasn't nothing. It wasn't homelessness. It wasn't. You know what I mean? There wasn't major mm-hmm. violence or anything. But um, during my drinking career, I identified everything about drinking with me as a person. So it was always those cutesy, like, I'm drunk things, and I'd go on Facebook and post pictures of us with drinks. You were there. I would post sure. pictures of us drinking. We'd mm-hmm. do wizard staffs and put Wee. beer boxes on our heads and shit. And uh, that was my whole personality was drinking, was alcohol, was, like, Hunter S. Thompson, was Charles Bukowski, was all these people who live life to excess, and me being a creative wanted to do that as well. I wanted to die like Jackson Pollock drunk Kerouac in a car wrecking. And, yeah, Pollock, yeah. Right? And so that made up my fundamental that was my fundamental keystone to my personality and so every christmas for gifts i would get like a handle of jim beam from someone and martini shakers and 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 shot glasses and shit like that pilsner glasses you know it's funny if i may real quick speaking of all that no, stuff go ahead. um i was at i was one of the um groomsmen at jerry's wedding in yeah. back in the day back in yeah. 2009 and so you know one of the traditions is to give the groomsmen all a gift and Jerry got us all flasks, but being the um, career alcoholics that he and I were, and some of our other friends, the flasks were about. Did it fit a? It didn't fit a whole gallon. Like it was a like half a half gallon? gallon flask. Yeah. So that's you know, like a sixty-four novelty. ounce flask. Mm-hmm. It's a novelty flask. I've never filled it up. I've never. I don't think I've ever used it. It's still up in the kitchen cupboard. I still have it, and I appreciate you. Yeah, um. my, mine's in my garage, <laughs> along with all the other drinking shit I've owned and haven't gotten rid of, right? Mm-hmm. So the personal anecdote was that I was looking through this hutch we had with all this decorative shit in it, and it was just full of shot glasses and full of, like, pint glasses and beer mugs and, and, and crystal liquor decanters and shit and, like, martini shakers. And I'm like, I don't need any of this. I don't have yeah. anything. And my wife is not an alcoholic she drinks she drinks she'll have a glass of wine every every night but she doesn't even really finish the wine she'll drink like half the glass of wine and fall asleep or just put it on the counter and wander Mm -hmm. off and go to bed you know so i i'm like we don't have parties that necessarily necessitate any of this shit and that was my paradigm shift. I, I realized like, wow, I'm my brain has changed now because I look at all this stuff and none of it holds an appeal to me. It just reminds me of things about myself that I didn't like, yeah. you know? And so now I'm looking at all these like ghosts of things about myself I didn't like. I haven't thrown it away yet though because my wife has a hard time letting go of things as you can see behind me. No, the listeners cannot. <laughs> but I, I, I think when they like go on vacation or something and like leave me at home, I might just dump all that shit out. But that was one of the big personal things I felt with this paradigm shift was that these things that I had made about myself no longer apply, you know, and it's a huge shift too. it wasn't like, oh, I don't like kale anymore. You know what I mean? It was like every aspect of my personality. I see these memes about Hunter S. Thompson and all those guys online and I feel bad for them now. I, I appreciate their work and I still love reading Bukowski's poems, even the drunk Bukowski poems, but I feel bad for him now. I don't feel like that's a lofty aspiration. It's more like. This empathy, this how hard, sad empathy, I feel like, damn, dude, I've been in that hole. And like, you feel dude, pain and suffering coming from the, you see it yeah, in the writing. Yeah, yeah, there's no disco ball in that hole. We're not having a good time in there. There's no glitter in there. I mean, you know, all that shit is just set dressing. But yeah. that was the big, that was the big paradigm. That was one of them. I mean, I've had countless numbers of them over the, brief Mm -hmm. period of my recovery you know but that was the one that stuck out to me most recently yeah i well i i I was a career bartender so you talk about putting alcohol as a uh, personality and putting you have to be a personality to be a bartender in most places you know they it it's kind of required so it becomes this sort of larger than life um the I think it was, was it Brian Brown in uh, Cocktail that said, you are the aristocrat of the working class? I guess. I, I, you saw Cocktail way more than me. There is no tattoo artist movie that applied like Cocktail applied to you than your flash bartender. Oh, good Lord. So 
So, you know, it became this thing where I remember thinking to myself and people would ask about how I got into it and stuff like that. And I used to have this joke where I'd say, well, you know, it was a, it was a passion and I turned it into a profession, basically making a a joke about how much I drink. And, but I was, I was, I was a bartender and I was known as a bartender and Mm -hmm. I was able to go into places and drink for free and go in and get good seats at restaurants and get really good, um, uh, service and get, uh, get people to open bottles of wine for me that were, that would never be open for anybody. And it was always like every single time was this fun party and like friends would come out and, you know, people knew me in the area and the, I would, you know, go and walk around my neighborhood and like, hey, John, how's it going? Yeah. I missed you last Thursday. You were or... the, we used to call you the Pope of Ballard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were the Pope, the, <clears throat> the smoking Pope of Ballard. Yeah. It was the neighborhood that we lived in. And um, yeah, and it was so it was very, very much it was it was not only who I was. I mean, before I even started tending bar, it was something I wanted to be. Like I thought that was going to, that was the pinnacle. That was the apex of my evolution is I was going to be a bartender. And once I reached that, like, I was like, well, this is, this is it. I've made it. And I quickly realized that like, it was not all that I thought it was. Well, yeah. Um, It became very, it became a very hard job and it's a very commendable job to anybody who does it. I don't have anything against bartenders service staff are some of my favorite people in the absolute world um but one of the things in recovery um when you talk about having things and i would call like you know artifacts from another age i had this (laughs) this whole section of my bookshelf was nothing but cocktail books bar books old ones that were that might be considered you know um collector's items stacks of you know just all kinds of different things and I remember at one point I had I had like all kinds of weird manuals and tons of stuff. And I, I remember thinking, like, I don't need these anymore. I'm not going to use these. I looked through them and I thought, like, this is really great. And there was some serious, you know, lofty aspirations at a, at a time. Right. Where I was going to take over the world. And I think it's possible that I could have had my alcoholism not been in the way. Because I was always too hungover to make morning meetings and to meet up with people. I was way too drunk when I did meet people who might have been influential in my future Mm -hmm. at the time. I would I would get way too drunk. I would be the sloppy guy at the party to the point where nobody wanted to talk to me. And I certainly didn't wake up to those morning phone calls. I wasn't going to the vermouth symposiums at 10 a.m. on Sunday because I couldn't make it. But I got rid of all those books and I gave them to a friend who's also a bartender and they were very appreciative to have them. But it was literally like, I don't need these anymore. I keep staring at them and they're not going to do me any more good, you know. And it was, I, I spent a lot of money on them and they yeah. were very helpful in a lot of ways. And um, so having to make that change and saying, I'm going to give this stuff up, it wasn't that it was... I was ever going to be thinking about like, well, maybe I'll get back into it or maybe I'll, I'll have another drink or maybe I need to, you know, try to remember what's in a pink squirrel, (laughs) you know, or whatever, which I think I still do. I think it's like, anyhow. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a big moment for me. And I had already been like, I don't know, two years sober and I still had all those books. Right. Before I finally got so rid of you, were them. still bartending. I was still bartending, so yeah. I mean, at least on that level, I thought that they might have some value to me. Right. Um, right. Yeah. But I don't. It's it's so not who I am anymore, and um, I think one of the biggest things. I mean, not only being in the program in the twelve step program that you and I are both uh, in, but also. Um, really just what is it they there's there's meditation there's um not drinking <laughs> that right yeah that's that, a big one that's and one the- um and really just how do i how do i tell people how do you retrain your brain i mean it's literally just that one day at a time i'm not going to drink today and it's a cumulative effect among the mm-hmm. other myriad of things that we have talked about on this program right Um, I don't know how you like, do you remember those moments in early recovery? Like when something might've like clicked or sparked or, well, 
because I, I looked at it like the to me also another aspect of the paradigm shift was like a course correction like like if you're on a play like you're on a ship right and you're heading mm-hmm. this one direction and you just kind of shift it like just a few degrees to the right or left starboard or port yeah um you start off with this tiny little course correction, but by the time you've gone a hundred miles, you are like way farther from the point you would have gone if you would have continued on your current course. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So this tiny little uh, manipulation of, of, of your path of your trajectory, like over time changes, you know? Um, so it was those little tiny manipulations. It was a different, I think the genesis of it was the realization that the approach I was taking was no longer functional. So now I needed to take a new approach, but I did not have the tools to learn how to draft up any new type of approach. So I went into this program that we're in and I'm not saying this program we're in is a cure all or will solve all of anyone's problems, but it worked for me. But I used, um, strategies, I guess is the word or philosophies Mm -hmm. that were suggested to me within this program. I use them, you know, I use them. I would, I, I tried to make myself more accountable and I tried to real, I tried not to be so hard on myself and realize that what I was doing was for the greater good and not to give in to that voice in my head that tells me to take the easier, softer way to use the language of it, you know, but Mm -hmm. because it was the easier, softer way. But it wasn't, you know, it was like, it was definitely easier, but it wasn't soft, man. It it was not (laughs) soft at all. So I feel like those tiny little manipulations in the beginning will set you, they're things that you can go back to and keep using and they'll set you on a better path, you know, or maybe a more preferable path, a path that, you know, will not end so tragically, you know, or Mm -hmm. so painfully or painful to those around you, you know. So, Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that that is that's a correct answer because I know there are specific things you know that we have to do in early recovery in order to maintain recover sobriety you know and then recovery you know I think I think finding finding a group or or a community that you can reach out to and be like you said be held accountable to mm-hmm. um but also for me it was realizing okay, I identified as an alcoholic. I identified as a drunk. I am, this is who I am, you know? Um, yeah. And I remember screaming that to people, no shirt on. Out of a car window. Alcoholic. Out of our window, out of a car window. <laughs> out of, yes. out of a cab window. Yes. So it's, um, the, so the idea is this is an addiction and this is a disease. That's, that's what I believe. Um, so it's not me. Right. That's just something that I contend with. If you have, right, if you right. have cancer, you are not the cancer. Um, this oh, just... I see where you're getting at now. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. so in those, in those early times, and I, I, I then began to realize that this was something that I could at least partially step away from and analyze because part of these, part of the program and part of the steps is, is not just understanding yourself and it goes, it goes deeper and a lot further than that. But I feel like that, that, that was a good, that was a first start for me. It was like, okay, so there's, there's information out there. I can learn about, this is an addiction. This is how it works. Well, you know, we talked about this last week about craving and, and obsession. And so you start to get the, the language of the disease that you have, and then you start to get the tools to um, figure out how to navigate yeah. those things that caused you pain. And again, it's, you know, what is an addiction? Um, I don't know if you have your dictionary, your, your handy dandy dictionary, but it's like you literally, you can't help yourself. You cannot help yourself. You are, you are a slave to whatever it is, whether it's alcohol or sugar or crack cocaine <laughs> or, you know, social media, which is a big thing. Um, I hear about a lot these days. So that was for me, definitely something where I could be like, I could turn the dial just a little bit and go, Oh, that's something to think about. And Oh, there's something that I can do about it. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. So it was, it was, it was that epiphany that I didn't like, Oh, I didn't have to, I don't, or I don't have to drink anymore. And you're like, you don't Oh, okay. have to, right? I don't, yeah, have, you don't to. have to. Yeah. That's the so, thing. It's not you don't get to. It's you don't have to. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I think that was a big um, a eye-opening shift. moment yeah. for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. was just that. Okay, I don't. So I don't have to. I thought that I had to. 
mm-hmm. you know, when, like I said at the top of the show, like, I got to get a drink. I need a drink, man. Oh, man, I just need a drink. What a day. I just right. need a drink. Right. And it's like, why? Well, it's just, it was a hell of a day. And yeah. so that no longer, that was just, it, it became more of like, what do you really need? What is really lacking in your life? What, right. you know, um, and after that, then came things like, you know, and I, God, I fought this one for a long time was things like meditation. <laughs> and yeah. why would I, why would I fight meditation? Well, it's, it's hard to do sometimes, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, like I would hear that. I would hear people say, Oh, well, you need to pray or meditate. And I'm like, Hey, I'm not praying, man. I, I am too cool to pray. <laughs> and I was like, B, I am not meditating. Cause I do not know how to do that. And then mm-hmm. there was a, I like tried it. Fucking YouTube has been like the most helpful thing in the world to me <laughs> in my entire life, man. Like, I would watch guided meditation videos on YouTube and then realize I didn't like the guy with the man bun talking to me. And I don't mind his man bun. I think it's kind of cool. I just didn't want to hear his voice. So then I would find like Tibetan bells and meditate to that. And then I'd go Mm -hmm. on a jag where I would meditate. I should be. I haven't lately because I've just fell off the practice and Mm -hmm. I can feel it. But I mean, I went through like an eight month period where I was meditating every day for like 15 minutes, listening to this Tibetan bell. And I'd feel better throughout the day. It was almost like my mind was at rest for a brief period of time before I got thrown back into the fray of all the shit I had to do, you know? Meditation's Mm -hmm. good. And even prayer now at this point, I've mentioned on previous podcasts, I I don't get down on my knees and pray. It's just a little moment of gratitude to whatever I'm grateful for. Uh, Mm -hmm. To me, I have a name for it. Like, you know, dear bear, I love you, dog, bear (laughs) dog, or whatever. But like, it's just, even if it's just a moment of gratitude. Yeah. You don't have to thank God. You don't ha- you don't have to even say God. You don't even have to believe in God. Just be like, you know what? I'm super grateful that my car is not broken down today or I'm super grateful that, you know, my wife didn't leave me or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I you know what? I'm super grateful that I had a piece of pecan pie. It could be something as simple as that. As long as you feel that gratitude, it, I think things improve quite a bit. That's part of that shift as well, that way of thinking because alcoholism is selfish. You don't you don't you deserve it. You're entitled to it. Everything you get, I'm entitled mm-hmm. to this. But then I think once that change starts to happen in your head and you start to regain the clarity, you're like, oh, I'm not entitled to shit. I should be very grateful because I don't deserve really, I don't deserve anything. You know, things, you know what I mean? Like, and that mm-hmm. sounds awful. I'm not trying to break it down like Fight Club style, but like, <laughs> well, you don't necessarily deserve things, you know. You're not owed anything. You're not, I, that's a better word. I think that is a better word. Yeah, you're not um, owed yeah. anything, but I yeah. think that everyone deserves happiness and everyone deserves a little bit of peace in their right. life. So let's scratch me saying deserve. <laughs> we'll just edit that out. Yeah. And just just dub in someone saying owed. owed. Yeah, like do Sean Connery or somebody. <laughs> someone cool. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's absolutely true. And I don't think there's any wrong way to meditate. It's kind of just sit quietly, you know, um, somebody once told me to, when I was struggling with the idea of prayer, which I guess is another P word for another alphabet, but next um, year for next year. But what if you just prayed to your higher self, a you, your the, the, the idea of yourself on a higher plane, on a higher vibration, which is also kind of what this is, is we're just sort of trying to develop our energy to a higher vibration. Because when I'm drinking alcohol, there's not much that I'm good for. There's not much that I can do for anybody else, let alone myself. Right. But when I'm sober, I can help other people. I can be a force for good. I have the energy. I have the time. And I have the resources to be a better version of myself or, you know, my higher self. Right. So that's something, too, to think about with people who... um you know, and myself included, who, like you said, man, I'm not going to pray and meditate. I pray and meditate. What is this? Um, I, I tried for a while and it wouldn't <laughs> stick and it wouldn't stick and it wouldn't no. stick. Yeah. And I use this uh, app, um, Headspace, which is really great. And um, I remember like I was like, man, I, and it, you, it's cost like $100 a year. And I remember I was at dinner with a friend of mine who was also in recovery and and he, he was like, yeah, you got to get this app, man. I was like, a hundred bucks a year? He's like, dude, this dinner that we're sitting down to, you're about to spend a hundred dollars on this dinner and you can't, right. you don't have a hundred, you don't have, you know, what is it? 30 cents a day for 
25 cents a day for your own well-being. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I got the app that night and um, I use it almost every day. Um, but it was hard at first and it didn't stick and it didn't stick and it didn't stick. And then I remember getting like 40 days in a row and I was like, holy shit, did I meditate 40 days in a row? Right. It's awesome. But then you felt better though, right? I mean, I felt things, way better. Yeah. I've your demeanor is much calmer since you bought the app, <laughs> you know, because I remember I had to go to work and I had to um, I was bartending and it was chaos. It was absolute madness. And it was just such a high stress job. And one of the things I do is 10 minutes before I went to work, I would just sit there and do a meditation. And I was like, OK, I can handle this. This is no big deal. What are these people going to say to me or do to me or or whatever? So, um I think prayer and meditation are awesome tools for um, to helping you change. It really is. A, it's a it's a change of personality. It was for me because I was just I'm not the same person that I was. I mean, I still have the, generally the same sense of humor. You have your core elements. You're just yeah. not as much of an asshole. You know, like <laughs> yes. you still have the core parts of you that like, mm -hmm. as far as us knowing each other personally, you still have those yeah. core parts that make me go, John is still my friend. I like these things about him, but mm -hmm. you don't have those other things that I didn't like about you, which I was drunk too. So it's not like, and, and the things I didn't like about you were just things that really affected my own selfishness. Like I was like, why don't you come over and bring me booze? <laughs> Yeah. Like what the hell? No, Watch well you. everybody was but, drunk, so nobody was able nobody had to be accountable. So no. every time that somebody was mean or flaky or just said some shit that you that wouldn't certainly fly today, it was like, Well whatever, right. man, I was just drunk. Yeah. I was sorry I was super wasted. Yeah. And if yeah. you if you said any of that shit to me or vice versa, we'd both be like, What's wrong with you, dude? You can't do that. This is not you don't get to treat me like this and Right. <laughs> yeah, if I went on one of those classic Jerry Rabble rants on you now, we mm -hmm. would like you would be like, dude, no, that don't fly. Back in the day, okay. you're like, eh, one five one. It was the Rumple Mints, mm -hmm. you know, but <laughs> it was all that rumpy. But so, uh, that's another personality shift. But I was gonna say, yes, I think we maintain the core of our personalities, but the mm -hmm. the those things, those little course corrections, those little paradigm changes, is, they definitely affect us in a positive way. You know, well, and, and you I mean, literally, you 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 I think you emotionally and, and mentally you grow up. Yes. And I didn't ever think that I was like, I'm fine, man. I can handle it. I can manage yeah. this. I'm fine. What do you hey, mean? The rent's paid. It's cool, hey, man. Fuck it. Yeah, exactly. The rent's mm -hmm. paid. Get off my back. Holmes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bills know? paid. Rent's paid. I don't remember <laughs> last week at all, but that's cool, though. And um, this. uh this idea that like, yeah, you have to grow up. And so these, these things that, and there was something about somebody once told me that when you quit drinking, when you start recovery, <clears throat> your personality and your emotional state is that of which, when you started drinking alcoholically. So if I quit drinking at 38, but I started drinking alcoholically at like 18, or 19. Yeah. And I drank some before that. But so that means f I showed up like three years ago as a n emotionally as a 19 year old kid. Yep. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the and the, you you literally grow up and it, I, I feel like for me it was it was exponential. You know, it wasn't something where it's like, I have to go through the next 19 years just to be a 38 year old human. No, being. it speeds up. It starts. <laughs> a, you start catching up eventually. Yeah, you actually do. Yeah. But you know what I mean. I, I don't know if least, you yeah. if you felt the same way with that. I like absolutely that idea. felt the same way, man. I absolutely. I mean, I started drinking alcoholically in my early twenties, but I started drinking at like sixteen. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I started drinking alcoholically, w once I sobered up, I was still dealing with the same tools that a twenty twenty two year old would use. And I was like in my late thirties with a child and a wife, and I was still using the tools of a twenty two year old man. You know, like, yeah. And I think now that, uh, you know, four years have passed and I'm in my 40s now, I'm like starting to feel more like a dude in his 40s, you know, mentally yeah. at least. At least how I feel like a dude in his 40s should feel about yeah. things. I don't know what a dude in his 40s is supposed to feel, but <laughs> what, I feel like I'm feel? doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I feel I don't feel as cranky. I was I, you might go to is going to say cranky, but I don't feel cranky as much as I used to. There are no. a lot of people who disagree with you, but that's just my veneer I put up. That's my professional 
veneer. How's your uh, how's your relationship with Coco? Oh, we're doing fine. <laughs> That's I've, good. I've, I'm training him to get down right now. Get down off That's the couch good. with treats. So we'll see what happens. That's we're good. cool. We're all right. I look at him like you fucking <laughs> dick. Well, but, I know. I know that you may have not been too warm on the idea of Coco oh no at the beginning i hate i don't like animals which is awful i probably shouldn't say on the podcast because everybody <laughs> loves animals i don't want to get any i don't wish any ill will towards animals i just don't want to be around them i don't like them mm-hmm. and my daughter loves them and i love my daughter so i'm like well let's try this noble experiment see what happens <laughs> and he gets on great with olive and megan and you know he gets on fine with me. He he knows not to play with me he just sleeps around me so i'm like ah, good agreement that's what we do you sleep I'm going to just keep ignoring you unless you need something. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're losing listeners on that. No, one. Like, <laughs> no it's, I just, hey, well, terrible. no, I just like, I like that idea of like, okay, well I have, I live with this animal and I just, I didn't always, you know, because you didn't, you didn't want to even get the animal at first. Oh no, hell no. And now, you know, I'm seeing Instagram stories of you I was about to say hey, rubbing him uh, on his belly on the couch. So <laughs> I'm not rubbing him. I'm <laughs> playing coarsely, you know, but so it's just that idea of like, okay, well things can change. That is it right there, yeah. Yeah, I was giving him affection, but it was definitely like uh, you know, dominant affection, like, hey, I'm the alpha here. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm gonna pet you extra hard. But no, not really. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say if you follow me on Instagram, you'll probably see dog selfies every once in a while because he's fucking. He smells horrible, but he's adorable. He's just busting rhymes already. He's ra- yeah. He brings out the rapper in me. <laughs> um, but yeah. So it just it's it sounds. I guess it's it's not easy, but it's simple. <laughs> is that yep. is that a good way of putting it? It's not. It's it's not simple. Yeah. It's not easy, but it's simple. You just have to change everything about your life. This is yeah. what somebody told me. <laughs> Good luck. Mm-hmm. Which and you know, um, so you can do it. It can be done. It can absolutely be done, and it, the rewards are just phenomenal. They're just beyond anything. If I can do it, and if Jerry can do it, I mean, if you ask uh, any one of our friends from back in our twenties who the drunkest people in that group and maybe in that town where they would have pointed Dude, at us us yeah and something would have been on fire or broken or i would mm-hmm. have made out with someone's girlfriend or it would have been yeah there would have been uh, just fire broken and make out make out <laughs> yes sloppy make outs from a little fat man. pretty much so it's really it's 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 genuinely doable it's not always easy but it's been one of the it has been the single most important decision of my life yeah. so far. Yeah. Nothing else nothing else would have come if it were not for that. None of this. I wouldn't be here. Yeah. We wouldn't be doing this. No. And I, We'd I, be doing this without recording it. We'd just be talking <laughs> to each other on FaceTime for the next four hours, just smoking in the house, smoking cigarettes while my daughter's downstairs. Uh-uh. Yeah. Assuming we, we weren't wouldn't... sharing some one bedroom apartment oh, somewhere. Oh yeah, assuming my wife hadn't already <laughs> shit canned me and I'd be living with you like <clears throat> I don't know, fucking <clears throat> Sonoma, the shitty Wizard part of staffs Sonoma. and mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's um it's great. I so I, I would say reach out to somebody that you trust. There are resources out there. Absolutely. Um don't be afraid, although it's fucking terrifying. Yeah. It's going to be okay. I don't want to. Yeah, you're gonna be it. all right. I promise you, you'll be, if you continue with it, you'll be okay. You'll get Mm -hmm. better than okay at one point. You'll be like good. And then you'll get better than good. And you'll be great with some shitty days. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's that. There's that. (laughs) Um, I just wanted to once again, say thanks to the Patreon um, patrons, patreon.com backslash a I F a Um, all kinds of cool, special content. Jerry and I are working on a book as well. And, oh yeah, um, we are doing a book. Yeah, yeah. we are doing a book, <laughs> which I swear is going to get off the ground here soon. Jerry's doing all the illustrations. Um, I've written it, and um, it's going to be awesome. So, um, yeah. just keep in touch. Say hello. A is for alcoholic. Dot com, and um, we'll Instagram. talk to you next week. Yeah, Instagram. Instagram at, yes, at all, A is for alcoholic. Yeah, just Google it up there, and you'll find us somewhere. Yeah.
Thank you for listening to A is for Alcoholic. Our music is by Neglect. You can find more of his music at neglectsound.bandcamp.com. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And contact us at aisforalcoholic at gmail.com.